See the lowly peasant, frequent denizen of our medieval fantasy role-playing games, there in the mud. Poor, illiterate, and ignored menial subject of the king. Uneducated in any way, owner of approximately nothing, dressed in whatever rags happen to fall to hand. Dirty, smelly, and riddled with a variety of less than fashionable diseases, they're no better than the pigs who wallow in the same muck alongside. Starving mostly, with far more children than they could possibly hope to support, ignorant of the finer things in life, unable to appreciate any higher virtues, yet almost entirely consumed with the most superstitious forms of religion, and don't get us started on just how many of them run anarcho-syndicalist communes. Needless to say, but we'll say it anyway, to the surprise of no one who is a regular listener of this show, almost none of that is true. If there was ever a more misunderstood inhabitant of the sorts of societies most of us tend to run our fantasy-themed games in, we don't know who it is. We have to give first prize to the peasant, because the vast majority of game designers, game masters, and players take one look at medieval society and immediately deduce that all the power is at the top, and anyone at the bottom must be a disenfranchised no-hoper whose life is brutish, nasty, and short. But we're here to tell you that virtually all of that is a lie. Or at least several kinds of very highly varnished half-truths that really don't stand up to scrutiny at all well. And as we'll see, the peasant deserves far more respect than we, or anyone else who has but a casual interest in medieval life, is prepared to give them. Because what the peasant suffers from most isn't disease, or poor education, or horrible living conditions, or starvation, or a general disregard for their well-being from the king and all his lords and ladies. No, what the peasant really suffers from is the worst sorts of propaganda employed by people who either didn't understand them at all, or had an axe to grind. Because you see, what the medieval peasant really was, in their own particular fashion, was in control of everything. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. To begin with, we have to deliver what will probably be the most shocking bit of information you will hear in the whole episode. And we know many of you are going to start jumping up and down almost immediately and scream at your listening devices about how we've got it all wrong. But stick with us, and we'll get through it together. You see, in the medieval period, there were no peasants. None at all. They did not exist. Go ahead and jump up and down if you must. We'll wait. All settled? Good. The reason there were no peasants in the medieval period was that the word peasant wasn't used by anyone until the 15th century. And if you'll recall, the Middle Ages, the medieval period, are generally agreed to have run from the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century CE until it gradually merged with the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery in the 15th century. In fact, the late medieval period officially ends in 1500 CE. So the word peasant was never used while peasants were still what we think of as the traditional definition of peasants in medieval times. The timeline just doesn't add up. Part of it is the fault of the French. Well, definitionally speaking. See, the word peasant comes from the French word paysan, which means a man or woman of the countryside. A little bit of conjugation, and you could have one paysan or several paysants. After that, it was just a short time until the word was mugged by English and incorporated into the vocabulary. Simple, really. It didn't mean anything more than that. So if anyone who lives in the country could be called a peasant, and the word itself wasn't around until people were mostly long done with being the sorts of peasants we think of, what then were the people living all those terrible medieval lives called? Basically, you had two types of people who worked the land back then. One type was free. They weren't required to work on behalf of anyone else, could go where they liked, and were able to take what they earned for their efforts and do with it mostly as they pleased. The other type was a serf, one of several different kinds. They were required to work on a specific piece of land and owed all their labor duties to a given lord. But it wasn't always like that, particularly in England which is where we often think peasants mostly came from, and particularly not prior to the 11th century. 
See, before then, most of the working rural population were slaves, which is where the word serf came from in Latin, service, and why some of the rural laborers had to be described as free. By and large, if you lived and worked in the country, with only a few exceptions, your life was not your own, and you were, in every sense of the word, enslaved to anyone with more power and strength or money to buy power and strength than you. And then the Battle of Hastings happened in 1066, and the Normans, under William the Conqueror, were suddenly in charge. And when they weren't viewing tapestries depicting the battle, they swiftly worked out that they didn't much like the English system of slavery. Though not because they were basically French and didn't like anything English, nor because they felt an inherent sense of the rights of man. Mostly, it was because they didn't like the idea of paying for everything. See, if you own slaves, you're responsible for their care, feeding, and housing. And that means that having slaves is very expensive indeed. And it turns out that the Normans, much like other people who actually have money, didn't like giving it away very much. So when William began installing various Normans and handing out parcels of lands and castles for them to take charge of and run, an objection was raised at the sudden influx of new expenses especially since the newly installed lords were still expected to provide military service to the king whenever he needed it in exchange for being allowed to live in all the neat castles and things. That sort of thing gets expensive all by itself without a load of new expenses added on top. The Normans still needed to have the English work the land, though. After all, there were important wars to go fight, and no self-respecting Norman lord was going to miss that, let alone figure out how to make things grow on his newly acquired land. The English already knew all that, so a simple solution presented itself. Rather than feeding and housing and caring for the serves ourselves, they said, let's make them care, feed, and house themselves instead. In exchange for letting them do that, we'll let them live on our land, set up little farms for themselves, and get on with life for, quote-unquote, free. All they have to do is agree to work the land and perform one or two other small duties for us, the lords, in exchange. Easy peasy. And thus was born one of the three kinds of serfs we spoke of earlier. The first group, cottagers, were people who worked as farm laborers, but didn't own any draft animals with which to do the heavier work needed. They had little plots of land which would just about sustain their families, provided nothing untoward happened during the growing season. Smallholders, the second group, had a home and a plot of land on which they could subsist, but also tended additional land for cash crops, which, of course, would be given to the lord of the land in payment. The third group, the one at the top of the serf heap, and the one we're most interested in because they're the ones we usually think of when we think of peasants, were absolute villains, and they were the most common type of serf in the medieval world. They got that name not because they were outlaws, but because the Normans organized these working families into what were called vills. And of course, once you have a few vills together in one place, what you have is a village. And the people living therein are called villains, V-I-L-L-E-I-N-S, and not V-I-L-L-A-I-N-S, though eventually everyone would settle on the word villager for reasons. These villains, comparatively speaking, had it pretty good. When the Normans came along, they really pushed for the whole villain lifestyle, so much so that within a few generations, slavery almost entirely disappeared from England in favor of the new system of serfdom. Villains were not only in a better position under the new system, they also had more status and rights. They weren't entirely free, they still had certain obligations to meet, but these obligations were now seen as one of the conditions of being allowed to live on and use the land the Lord provided, rather than the old method of simply working for free with no rights at all and treated like a piece of property at the whim of the Lord until they died. Villains could rent land and houses from the Lord. Each plot of land came with enough room for a farm of their own on which to grow animals and crops in addition to land set aside for growing crops for the landlord. Part of their rental contract was that they would spend a certain amount of time working for the Lord in exchange for their rent. Basically, they worked off part of the cost of their rent. It wasn't that bad, though. Most of the time, they only worked two or three days a week. On the remaining days, they were allowed to go about their business on their own lands. Even then, the two or three day requirement was only during times when their labor was needed, mostly during sowing and harvest times. The rest of the time, they could work to their own profit, tithing 10% of any money they earned or crops gathered to the Lord's stocks. 
In addition to that, the Lord was required to provide for their safety and security and defend the land and its people in case of attack. It wasn't all sunshine, though. The villain wasn't allowed to leave the land without the landlord's permission. His knowledge, service, and work were too valuable. Ideally, if a villain wanted to leave the land of one lord and go to another, say, because a member of the serf's extended family were ill and needed care, an exchange could be made between the current lord and the lord of the land the serf wished to move to. Otherwise, villains who snuck off in the night or otherwise left without permission were in a precarious position, on the one hand being regarded as having stolen from the lord in question, and on the other without a place to go that would readily accept them. There were penalties if another lord's serfs were found working on your land. One reason the villain was so important was that the Norman conquerors had no real idea how to manage the lands they were now in charge of. It took the villains to organize all that needed to be done to ensure that crops grew, livestock thrived, and that the village and therefore the manor survived from year to year. In order to do so, a manor court would be formed, consisting of villains from the manor's village and the lord's steward. Together, they would work out the mundanities of village and farm life. When to harvest and sow, when to graze which animal where, who owned which bit of land, and how all the common areas of the village should be cared for, and by whom. The villains on the manor court were elected by members of the village. One of them would hold the position of reeve, and it was his job to oversee the whole court. Other positions were held by people with a particular specialty, like the Hayward, who watched over the village crops. And it is in the manor courts that we begin to see just how much power the so-called peasant really had. In the manor court's purview were all the concerns of both the manor and the village. They were empowered to assess fines and punishments for infractions of the agreed-upon rules and practices of their domain, and this included the lord as well. They could charge the lord for infractions and assess fines for things as seemingly incidental as leaving turf turned up on the common lands and petition the parliament regarding their treatment by the lord in question if his actions were particularly egregious and infringed upon their rights. And any regulations they didn't like or found inconvenient, they often ignored or found a way around so that life in the village was often all in favor of the villains and not such a hardship at all. One story even relates that an entire village acted as if they had all gone mad when it was discovered the king would be passing through, which would make the road through the middle of the village a king's road and subject to future taxation for its maintenance and upkeep. Rather than take on new taxes, the villagers feigned extreme insanity, and rather than risk catching whatever the villagers had that made them insane, the king and his retinue bypassed the village, and the village went about their lives untaxed. Throughout the Middle Ages, the villains grew in power and authority as they got used to the new way of life. The Normans had to respect the traditions and practices of the English serfs because they were the only ones who really understood how to make things grow and thrive, and therefore turn a profit for the lords they worked for. And of course, this was a two-way street. Rather than living in mud and squalor, many medieval peasants were living in what for the time was more than adequate shelter and a certain amount of luxury. Archaeological finds from the time show that many villains had fine French imported crockery, which certainly meant they were turning a profit and had ready supplies of coin. The floors of their buildings were made of timber and kept clean and dry. They ate well most of the time and only really suffered in times of famine or severe weather. While it is true that some villains shared a building with their animals, often this meant that the animals had access to the ground floor and that people slept on elevated platforms well above the ground level. In all, while not perfect, the life of a villain was not as bad as our vague historical assumptions like to make it. And then, in the late 1340s, the Black Death came to England. Caught in the aft end of the Hundred Years' War, England was ravaged by both the war and the plague. And estimated, because people were too busy dying to write things down, 40 to 60% of the population of England just up and died. Which is a lot especially if you depend on a vast majority of that population to do most of the work that needed doing. Of course, since there were fewer people to do the work that needed doing, there was more work for those people to do. Which meant that there was a scarcity of labor. And when there is a scarcity of anything, the law of supply and demand gets to have a go at running the prices up as people try to buy up what little remains. Suddenly, villains had it all their own way. 
they could ask for and receive actual wages to stay and work on their landlord's land. Not only that, they could demand raises once they were being paid for their work. And, as if that wasn't enough, with the sudden untimely demise of so many workers, a serf could up sticks and practically guarantee himself of finding a better position under a new lord for better pay because they were just as desperate for labor as his present lord. And even if that didn't work out, well, there were plenty of abandoned holdings and lands to occupy for the enterprising, newly independent future landowner. Wages doubled, but the reduction in population and demand meant that prices on food and goods were falling. Suddenly, it was very profitable to be a serf. And to top it all off, the Hundred Years' War was still going on, a hundred years not having passed yet, and the taxes to finance it all kept going up, because surprise, surprise, there aren't as many people still alive to pay them. And it's all this that begins to put an end to serfdom. The villains and other serfs discover they have all the economic power. It's not the lords of the manor anymore. And it certainly isn't those officials in London and around the country who can't even end what is an increasingly expensive and bloody war. And increasingly, they've been getting more and more of a taste for this freedom thing they've all heard about so much from people like priest John Ball, who was called the Mad Priest of Kent and advocated for the equality of all people. And frankly, the serfs are all getting a little tired of everything, what with them being more or less in charge of their own destinies for possibly the first time ever. By 1381, it all comes to a head, and most of the serfs in England have had more than enough. On May 30th of that year, John Brampton, Archdeacon of Lewes, has what is probably the worst day of his life after realizing that several villages in the county of Essex haven't paid their poll taxes a tax which is levied on each and every eligible person just for being alive. Eat. He and several of his friends head into the village of Brentwood and summon local officials from several villages around the county to come explain themselves and pay up. While waiting, he adds to his little entourage with several members of the local council to act as jurors should the occasion arise. Probably wouldn't be needed, he must have thought. Surely the people will see they are in the wrong and cough up the dough without any problems. When the delegation from the village of Fobbing arrived, Brampton must have seriously reconsidered just how much trouble this was all going to be. Instead of the two or three representatives he may have expected, what he got was a well-organized mob packing bows and sticks. Suspiciously well-organized, one might suspect. In any case, the leader of the fobbing group, Thomas Baker, informed John Brampton that he was disinclined to acquiesce to his request, and that he should depart this locale and cease bothering he and his people, as it was unlikely he, Mr. Baker, would be forthcoming with any more remuneration, as that particular debt was previously discharged. Or words to that effect. Brampton then made the third and final mistake of his day, and attempted to have two of his what can now only be called henchmen arrest Mr. Baker. A move that ended with the henchmen dead, the local jurists dead, Mr. Brampton in full retreat from an angry mob all the way back home, and, by end of day, almost all of the southeast of England in open revolt and marching on London. Most of the mob was composed of rural workers, local officials, and various other artisans all intent on finally doing something about all this excess serfdom laying about while clearing up the confusion of who owed how much for which of the various taxes being levied against the populace. Along the way, why not also get all these people out of the country several jails, because if we're going to do something about taxes, it seems unfair to leave all these tax avoiders locked up. The man they picked to lead them was the relatively unknown Watt Tyler, who led the assembled mobs from Canterbury towards London. At Mile End on June 14th, they ran into King Richard III just outside London. Not by himself, of course. No, he'd brought quite the retinue with him, including various officials from London and assorted others. And it helps to understand the course of the meeting if you keep two important things in mind. First, all the king's horses and all the king's men were mostly not anywhere to hand. It's that Hundred Years' War again. They're either all over at the fighting doing the fighting, or scattered throughout the country on other business. Very few knights and soldiers are around to help the king defend the city should the need arise. The other important thing to remember 
is that King Richard III is all of 14 years old. So, Watt and the King, by all reports, meet and have a pleasant conversation, in which Watt explains that they want only a few things to be made right. Among them, that there should be no tax beyond the usual one-fifteenth of movable wealth, the end of serfdom, the right to be paired fair wages, and a few other little details like cheap rents. The meetings go on for a couple of days, all with King Richard promising to do all that he could fairly grant. And really, there it would have and should have ended in relative peace. If only someone in the king's entourage hadn't become upset with the way uncultured Watt Tyler took a drink in front of the king. He called Watt names. Watt took offense and attacked the man, and was subsequently wounded and died. After that, all bets were off, and chaos ensued for the next several days, with the rebels entering London, executing certain officials, and burning tax records in a fine example of if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. Which, since all these lowly serfs were able to identify the documents they wanted to burn, meant that the peasants were well able to read, in addition to being well organized. It is later reports back to France by the French about the peasants' revolt, along with the English ruling class's own efforts to discredit the rebels, that eventually gives us the typical characterization of the English peasant that we know so well today. And so ended, after a little more time, the entire institution of English serfdom. Sure, the rebellion was eventually put down and the leaders and instigators executed. But the landowners realized something. If the serfs didn't want to be serfs anymore, that meant the lords didn't have to employ them and protect them and take care of them anymore either. In fact, on the whole, it was far better, easier, and less troublesome to do what the landlords then did, which was to work almost entirely with sheep. If this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. We hope you've enjoyed it, had a little fun, and learned something along the way. We put out new episodes once a week on Wednesdays, and you're more than welcome to subscribe in whatever podcast wrangling device you use. We don't mind. In fact, we love it when you do. If you're already a regular listener, thanks. It's nice having you around for each of the episodes, and it is our hope that you continue to use what you learn here not only to ensmarten yourself, but also to add lots of neat little details to your game table and entertain your friends. Perhaps you've received enough of a value to consider supporting the show on Patreon. Head over to gmwordoftheweek.com and click the yellow banner at the top of the page to find out how. We'd love to be able to provide any of the fine little extras your heart desires and that are available only to our Patreon supporters. And if you are one of our Patreon patrons, welcome to you too. And thank you very much for your support. The commercial you prevented everyone hearing today was all about a multiplayer mobile game with microtransactions. So thanks for that. You did good. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, peasantly surprised Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then the gentleman?